from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, efforts to stop coastline erosion in Louisiana by actually cutting into the levees. We try to reestablish what was here before with the river built historically. As new tariffs against the EU loom, U.S. Dairy talks about what the impact could be here. And the EPA releases a long-awaited new agreement on ethics. It uh, ensures the certainty of 15 billion gallons being 15 billion gallons. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all-new Silverado HD, the strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The EPA has unveiled a plan it hopes will help ease farmers' concerns about ethanol and increased demand. Under the plan, there would be an unspecified increase in the amount of ethanol oil refiners would have to blend starting next year. Now, the EPA putting the issue up for public comment. But Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer says the EPA will calculate the new blending volume requirements based on the amounts waived over the previous three years. The big part of the announcement, once the rules are finalized, EPA says it will ensure more than 15 billion gallons of ethanol are blended every year. The plan will also include relief to small refineries. EPA is hoping to finalize this rule later this year. Meanwhile, Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue discussing the announcement Friday on AgriTalk with Chip Flory. That's exactly what this proposal does. It uh, ensures the certainty of 15 billion gallons being 15 billion gallons. And uh, EPA has agreed at the president's direction to uh, reflect any potential small refinery waivers uh, that are being issued uh, there to uh, account for those in the overall total to ensure that the uh, the minimum of 15 billion gallons is obtained. EPA also saying it will build on the president's plan to have E15 sales year round by working to streamline labeling and removing other barriers to the sale of E15. One of the provisions here the EPA has agreed on are those pumps that are that are yeah. capable and certified for E10 can now be used for E15. Renewable fuels groups calling the deal a win, while critics think it could open the door to even more small refinery waivers. And discussion about farm size has ruffled a lot of feathers in farm country. Secretary Sonny Perdue attending the World Dairy Expo in Madison, Wisconsin, saying, quote, in America, the big get bigger and the small go out. He went on to say, quote, I don't think in America we, for any small business, have a guaranteed income or guaranteed profitability. Chip Flory also asking Purdue about that comment on AgriTalk. It was not a get big or get out kind of uh, mandate. It was just the reality that it is tough to make it uh, in the dairy business milking 40 or 50 cows these days unless you just have a heart for dairy. And by golly, bless your heart if you do. I, I want to encourage those people who do that. But this is not uh, the message it took away and other people picking up this story was not a uh, admonition for me to get big or big out, to finance, get big or get out, because the, uh, as we know, in a capitalistic American economy, we see consolidation in a lot of industries, and people know it, whether we like to recognize it or not, we know that is occurring in, the, in agriculture. At World Dairy Expo, attention was also on trade and concern the European Union could retaliate after the U.S. promised to put $7.5 billion worth of tariffs on European goods this month after the verdict of a WTO case. Now, the U.S. putting tariffs on EU cheese and some butter products. Ag Day national reporter Betsy Gibbon looks at what this could mean for producers here at home. There's no denying dairy demand outside of the U.S. helps drive prices, especially our number one buyer, Mexico. Exports to Mexico in the early part of the year have been up quite a bit, and we do see them coming up a little bit more. Stevenson believes future sales to Mexico may be hindered due to political turbulence, even though sales look good for now. They wanted to diversify their portfolio a little bit, and they've started to buy from other vendors, uh, uh, most notably the European Union. The U.S. is planning on placing tariffs on the European Union. Now the EU threatens to retaliate. The EU is a competitor to the U.S. dairy industry. 
And the United States is still trying to gain the same, if not more, access to overseas countries, which normally buy from the EU. We'll open new markets to approximately $7 billion in American agricultural products. Take the first step bilateral deal the U.S. and Japan signed last month. What we need to have happen is that the U.S. cannot be at a competitive disadvantage with other nations like New Zealand, with the European Union, that also want to sell dairy products. A team of Democratic lawmakers penning a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative worrying the export access won't be enough for U.S. dairy. Saying, quote, his agreement would achieve inferior market access for U.S. dairy compared to competitors like the European Union. And EU was very smart. They went in and they basically asked for everything they wanted, and, and that included geographical indicators. That has put them in a little bit of a, uh, a lead position, especially on the cheese side of things. We were going to lose a lot of ground to the EU if we didn't get something signed. The U.S. has seen falling exports to China, another top buyer since the beginning of the year. While many associate soybeans with ASF and retaliatory tariffs, it's occurring with dairy products too. We still have some exports to China, but they've dropped a lot. And of course, um, one of our largest exports to China has been um, whey powder and lactose, uh, much of that being used, of course, for um, feed for animals. As overall demand continues to increase domestically, the industry hopes the thirst for U.S. dairy will continue over the water too. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Canada is also a buyer of U.S. milk, but not a top purchaser. Both the U.S. and Canada have yet to ratify that trilateral deal between the U.S., Mexico and Canada. Later this week, we expect top trade negotiators from China to meet their counterparts in Washington. And President Trump says his call for China to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden will have no bearing on the upcoming trade talks. So I'd like to do a trade deal with China, but only if it's a great trade deal for this country. One thing has nothing to do with the other. The president continuing to say he believes China wants to make a deal. China also continuing to struggle with African swine fever. Now, according to a new report from Rabobank, China is on track to lose 55% of its hog herd to ASF. Rabobank economists now forecasting China's pork meat output to fall by 25% this year. That's also driving retail prices of meat to record levels and pushing consumption lower. But it's not just China. ASF is spreading across Asia, Vietnam, has already lost about 20% of its hog herd. That's expected to continue to climb throughout this year. Producers starting to spend long days again out in the fields. As meteorologist Mike Hoffman has more in today's crop comments. Mike. Thanks, Clinton. Well, it sure helps to have a little company while you're working sometimes. Just like at the Schultz family farm in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Their five-year-old son joining them in the cab. As you can see, he was all smiles about it. Now, taking a look at the uh, jet stream, uh, you know, this is a pattern we haven't seen in more than a month. A trough in the east, ridge in the west. We'll tell you what that means for your forecast coming up, and I'll have more on that in just a little while. When we come back, we'll talk about forage harvest and silage demand from the dairy state, and later see how a Gulf state like Louisiana is working to stop erosion along its coastline. That story in the country. Hey y'all, Justin Moore here. Get ready to kick up some dust with the Rock Sword Dirt Roads and a Country Show Sweepstakes. Enter now for a chance to win a customized off-road Rock Sword and two VIP tickets to one of my upcoming concerts. Visit rocksoaroffroad.com forward slash Justin Moore. As harvest picks up pace, not all of that corn is being picked for grain, especially in the dairy state of Wisconsin, where we find Ag Day's Betsy Gibbon once again with analyst Mike North. Mike, when you look at some of the Wisconsin corn crop we have here, two thirds of it, not even two thirds of it, is dented. And in the spring, we had some worries that there wouldn't be enough crop for, for haylage, silage, bedding. Do you still see that when it comes to dairies, that there still may be a need, or do we have enough supply right now? Well, I think the bigger question this fall is going to be how we bring all of this together. Because to your point, uh, we had a lot of late planted corn. Some of it, a lot of it, still not dented yet. How will it come through the fall? What kind of quality are we going to have? And then as a dairyman, how am I going to deal with that? Because if I have corn that's still not dented or I have corn that's maybe still trying to put an ear in place, 
that is not going to be the same kind of silage that I'm used to harvesting. Right. And so I'm going to have to deal with that. I might have some good silage to go with it. I might have picked up a lot of ground from a neighbor grain farmer who put everything in prevent plant and I went out and put in sorghum sudan and late planted oats and some other crops uh, to try to you know, fill my concern for lack of forage. Overall, I think in the end, we end up with plenty of forage in terms of available supply. Okay. But the question now will be how we blend it all together. How do we price it too with, you know, with, with the neighbor that we might be buying it from? Because if it's late planted corn, doesn't have the same quality, I can't pay the same per ton that I would on a, you know, a decent stand of corn that's perfectly ready for silage. And uh, UW has a great uh, uh, tool that has been put, to, put together to help to that end. Uh, but that will be a big issue. And then the nutritionist gets to wave his wand this fall and try to bring all of this stuff together because that's really going to be interesting as we bring all these different types of forages that we typically don't use and pull that back into a ration. A hard job that, on that That's that going to be a hard job. I don't have very much time left, but one of the things I do want to ask you is do you think that some of these dairies will have to truck in some of this to help their needs? And do they have enough money when you look at markets right now to potentially truck that in? It, it's going to be an expense, but the one thing that will need to come in is dried hay and straw. And those will be things that we typically do pull up uh, from other states, but we're gonna have to we're still gonna have to pull a lot of that in this winter. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a moment. Cut through the uncertainty in the markets. Give Mike a call at 608-764-0012. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman kicking off our forecast for the week. And if we look at rainfall over the past week, you can see, yeah. boy, a lot of rain fell in that streak right through the middle of the country. Right. A lot of this is from a little more than a week ago because this takes us from a week ago Saturday to this past Friday. But you can see that huge strip of rain. But the heavy stuff went from eastern New Mexico across the panhandle of Texas. Kansas got a decent amount, but then it picked up again. Uh, northern Missouri, southern Iowa, right across northern Illinois, and the southwestern portions of the Great Lakes with some of those areas uh, getting uh, five inches or more. Anything in red is five inches plus. Anything in orange is three inches plus, so you can see some of those areas. Mainly north of Lubbock, uh, right through the Amarillo area. Uh, stayed north of Oklahoma City. Wichita got a decent amount. Kansas City, decent. And then you can see right along the uh, Iowa-Missouri state line into the Peoria area, into South Bend, Indiana, even Chicagoland, at least the south side, definitely got some huge amounts of rain. There's the jet stream. Uh, again, this is a totally different pattern than we've seen over the past four to five weeks. Uh, where we, we've had the trough out west, where you folks have been getting cold and even some early season snows, but the heat has remained, especially in the southeast, but even in the parts of the Great Lakes occasionally. Now that has changed. Now we'll see where it goes from here. That first trough moves away, and as we head into the middle of next week, a little bit of a ridge kind of develops over the Great Lakes in the northeast. <clears throat> You'll notice that's not nearly as hot in the southeast, though, in this pattern. But another strong trough digging into the Pacific Northwest, northern Rockies. By later in the week, that's moving through the upper Mississippi Valley. And even all the way down into parts of Oklahoma and Arkansas will be the southern fringes of that storm. And that will continue to move northeast across the Great Lakes uh, next weekend. And so each one of these troughs brings a quick shot of colder air, keeping things uh, from getting nearly as hot as they have been. So let's check things out. Uh, precipitation this week, I'm looking for above normal uh, throughout the Mississippi Valley up to the Great Lakes, back into Montana, below normal southwest, back to California, or California and then above normal in uh, southern Florida. Temperatures this week below normal for most of the Plains states and the northwest for a change. Not the northwest, but the Plains states for a change. Above normal northeast, southeast, and far southwest. 30-day outlook for temperatures then uh, from uh, Minnesota westward, below normal, above normal from Texas into the southeast and mid-Atlantic. Precipitation 30 days southeast, below normal, above normal, Great Lakes, northern Plains, down into parts of the southwest. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. 
Heading to Kalispell, Montana, first of all, mixture of clouds and sunshine today. High of cool, 62. Springdale, Arkansas, lots of sunshine. Comfortable for a change, high of 70. And finally, Watertown, New York, clouds with times of rain, high about 56. Up next, the equipment expert himself, Machinery Pete. Looking for a deal, folks? Check out five-year-old used combines. Stick around, I'll tell you the scoop. Ag Day. Brought to you by the Milk Business Conference. Don't miss this dairy business focused event November 11th and 12th, 2019 in Las Vegas. Register today at milkbusinessconference.com. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. It's harvest season, and no doubt you're already thinking about your combine situation. Machinery Pete is too, and today he's got some insights on recent auction prices for models with just a few years on them. Well, folks, I'll get right to it. I think there's a great buying opportunity right now around five-year-old used combines. Now, people come up and they ask me, hey, Pete, what's happening in the used combine market? Well, what I've been telling them the last 18 months, there have been two hot spots. One, you get out to that eight to 10 plus year old stuff, really good condition, and we're seeing premium dollars paid for that nice older stuff. So we've seen things like a 9870 go for $140,000. Also recently a John Deere 9570 for $123,000. Uh, pretty big dollars there. Now the other hot spot has been the one to three year old range uh, used combines, mostly still under warranty with lower hours, very uh, attractive price point versus a new one. So we see things like this 2016 John Deere S670, 1,056 engine hours on it, sold on a July 27th consignment auction in Northeast Missouri, went for $235,000 with no heads. Now folks, that's the second highest auction price I've ever seen on an S670 uh, 16 model. Now here's a look on the topic of S670s, uh, current values broken down by the model year. Of course, Deere made these, this model from 2012 to 2017. Now here you can see the average auction price this year and also the current average dealer advertised price. And if you look, the, the widest gap between those figures is on the 2014 model, so five years old. So folks, there are some good deals here. You know, call your local dealer, uh, check out our machinerypeat.com website. I've also noticed in the last quarter, the average advertised price by dealers on S670s has dropped 5.1%. What if you lost a football field worth of land at your place? Well, it's happening to the state of Louisiana. How often and what are researchers doing to try to stop it? That story's next. Hey y'all, Justin Moore here. Get ready to kick up some dust with the Rock Sword Dirt Roads and a Country Show Sweepstakes. Enter now for a chance to win a customized off-road Rock Sword and two VIP tickets to one of my upcoming concerts. Visit rocksoaroffroad.com forward slash Justin Moore. It's estimated Louisiana loses land the size of a football field to the ocean every hour. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, Louisiana lost an average of 16.6 .6 square miles of land a year from 1985 to 2010. Now, as Stacy Plaisance reports, officials think they've found a plan to fight coastal erosion in the state. South Louisiana, ground zero in the nation's fight against coastal erosion amid climate change, hurricanes, and sea level rise. The state now armed with an ambitious plan to reverse land loss. The more green stuff we can put in place in our basin, between our levees and our barrier islands is good for storm surge and reducing wave height during hurricanes and storms. The plan starts with the Mississippi River, the freshwater sediment source that built Louisiana and the Gulf Coast over thousands of years. Levees like this one, built in the last century to protect cities and towns from flooding, have in turn starved the coastline of rich nutrients and silt needed to not only create land, but sustain it. Louisiana's plan calls for cutting into the levees to redirect fresh river water back to the coast. We try to reestablish what was here before with the river built historically. Experts say these long-term diversions will create land at a fraction of the cost of dredging, which scoops sediment from one location and deposits it into another. For a dredge project, we may be talking about 100 acres, 200 acres, or 1,000. Diversions have the potentials for tens of thousands of acres. 
Supporters say this existing diversion near New Orleans gives a hint of what can happen on a much larger scale. That's what we want to see. Future diversions will be bigger and deeper. But that's a worry for fishermen like Brad Robin. Oysters need a certain amount of salt water to survive. I know it's going to destroy it. Critics also question whether enough land can be created to offset the rate of erosion. But the diversions will take years to build as Louisiana continues to lose thousands of acres of shoreline every year. Stacy Plaisant, The Associated Press. Thanks, Stacy, and that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you started your week with us. From all of us here at Agdam, Clinton Griffiths, have a great day.